Can you hear me? Good? Yeah. Awesome. First step out of the way. Uh, good morning. Uh, it is encouraging, I admit, now that I've been at the church for a little bit, to look out and see so many faces of people that I, that I, I love and respect. Um, and so it's uh, extremely humbling to have the opportunity to uh, share a little bit about uh, what God's kind of teaching me uh, through studying for this sermon. And uh, I, I feel completely underqualified to do this, uh, but I know he's pretty qualified. And so hopefully he can speak through me uh, in a way that maybe you can get something out of it. Um, actually, I know you'll get something out of it because I know his word's not going to return void. So that's pretty cool to know. So uh, what I'm going to be ending is Galatians chapter 5. If you have a Bible, there's some, some Bibles in front of you if you don't have one or if you got your app on your phone like most of us. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, and uh, we're going to be in verses 13 through 26. I'll give a little bit of background about Galatians, uh, and then we'll kind of jump into it. So the uh, book of Galatians uh, was authored by Paul, um, one of the undisputed ones, uh, around the year uh, 48 AD. Uh, Galatia, I think there's something cool too, is I, as I was a kid growing up, I remember always uh, being distracted in church by looking at the maps in the back of the Bible. I don't know if you were anything like me. And I remember it seems so foreign, right, this idea of the Mediterranean and where Paul's ministry went. How cool is it that we're pretty much right in the center of it right now? Um, and if you don't take opportunity to go see some of these places that were talked about, uh, you're missing out. Uh, I was in Rome and got to see the supposed place uh, where Paul was in prison. It's just spectacular to think about that, uh, where Paul was walked around when he went and had his meeting with the emperor. He's walked across this forum, and, and you can go there and walk that same place. Pretty spectacular. Uh, so the area of Galatia is north of where Cyprus is. Cyprus is an island in the Mediterranean, uh, kind of modern-day Turkey would be the area it was. Uh, Paul went to Galatia, and he's, he's preaching, and he's bringing the gospel pretty much, and that was part of Paul's uh, larger ministry. And, and what was there was already a, a large contingent of Jewish people, and so he's pretty much bringing the gospel to Jews, which is something that Paul was obviously very, very good at, um, in, in addition to his Gentile ministry. And so when Paul comes there, he preaches a very simple gospel. It's one that says that the only through Christ can he have salvation, that Christ came and fulfilled the law, and that you no longer need all this other stuff, but you just need Christ. Uh, and he provided that to them, and, and they bought in. They were on board, and they started a, the, a Christian church in Galatia. Uh, Paul leaves, and actually not very long later, um, he gets word that uh, they're starting to add things back. They're starting to add things back to the gospel. The simple gospel that he had betrayed that they had bought into, he, they are now adding back onto with different rules uh, from the Jewish tradition. Um, and so he gets word of this, and what these people are, there's these teachers that are rising up, probably leaders in the, that Christian church, um, that are adding back some of these Jewish traditions, uh, circumcision, some other things like that. And what's interesting is that at the time, there's still a Jewish culture there. So there's still Jewish uh, uh, leaders there that have probably authority in the region. And so these leaders that arise in the Christian church are actually appeasing these Jewish leaders by adding back in some of these traditions from the Jewish past. At the same time, they have a lot of power in their own church because they're saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I know Paul said that salvation, but here's the other three things you have to do. Uh, to get back to salvation. So they have a lot of power, but they're also avoiding persecution. So you can see why naturally as humans they would kind of build on that. So Paul writes his most critical letter uh, in the Bible to the Galatians because he sees what's happening here, and it's a very dangerous thing. Uh, and in, in my line of work, I understand how lies work, and the best lies are ones that are very, very close to the truth. And so the danger of this situation that we have in Galatia is that it's very close to the gospel, but it's gospel plus. There's this little bit of extra stuff that's being attached to it, and that's a dangerous thing. It's legalism. You've all probably heard that term before, and you've probably all been part of churches at times that have had a legalist kind of view on, on life where, hey, there's the gospel, but I also need you to meet this checklist before you can either be part of our church or before you can be a Christian. And so that's what he's writing this letter against overall, the, the book of Galatians. Um, so uh, I would like to pray uh, now that you have some of that background, and then we'll kind of break down our section. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I do thank you for this opportunity that that you've given me to share your word. I pray that I would decrease to nothing and that you would rise and be glorified. That when people hear this, this your word, uh, that it would be sharp as you've designed it to be, uh, that it would show us areas in our lives where we can adjust and improve uh, and change, but ultimately, Lord, that we'd see our need of you and that only in you will true change come from. Lord, pray that we would have heart change, heart change, and so that from that would flow out uh, a change in our behavior in our lives. We love you, Lord. Amen. Okay, so Galatians chapter 5, uh, again, the epistles are awesome, action-packed. If you want a place to study and you haven't been studying the Bible, jump back into the, some of these letters. They're great. When I say epistles, I mean letters. When I say letters, some of the Galatians, Ephesians, they are different letters in the back of the Bible. Uh, so the first 12, 12 verses of the Bible is talking about how Christ, when he came, freed us from the ceremonial law. Ceremonial law would be this idea that there are 
traditions. Uh, we can definitely think about churches we've been a part of that had these traditions that kind of hung on, right? Maybe they're not directly described in the Bible, but they're law. But what it doesn't free us from, the other side, the risk we have, is it doesn't free us from moral standards. Uh, God's law is actually fulfilled by Christ. When he says in the, in the Bible in Matthew 5, 17, uh, Christ says, I didn't come to abolish the law. I didn't come to just destroy everything you have in the back of your Bible. I came to fulfill it and actually amplify it and make it better. So what that means is that's why when you have a Bible in front of you, you don't just have a New Testament. You have an Old Testament and a New Testament. You, these laws in the back, those Leviticus kind of weird ones, they still have a purpose and they still mean something. And so Christ says that he came to fulfill it. Uh, many religions kind of get caught in between the two. Uh, and they start saying, well, we're going to keep these rules, but we also accept there's forgiveness. And then you get really this kind of sin and confess mentality where you're sinning and confessing. You're still trying to hold on to the law, but you recognize that Christ is the one who can forgive. Um, the Galatians, you know, wanted to add something back in, add something back to the gospel. What they chose to add uh, was, was circumcision. You can see why. It's a black and white thing. Either you are or you aren't. And if you are, this is needed for salvation. If you're not, then you're not saved. Uh, and so I think it's important that we think about, uh, both in our lives and in our church, what are the things we have added to the gospel? Um, all, we should always be checking. What have we, what have we made a pseudo-gospel? What have we made something that is required for salvation? What have we added to it? Uh, so as we get into this text, I want you to think about something uh, that there's a guy, Kyle Eidelman, he does a, a series on Galatians, and he, he gives a really good phrase that I think captures what we're going to be looking at as we talk about Galatians 5. Uh, and he says this, we have been set free to live different. And living differently is not about trying, it's about relying. There's a lot in that. So the idea that we've been set free is we've been set free from the burden of this law um, so that we can live different, not just for any reason, not just so we're free, but so that we can live in a different way. Uh, and then when we live differently, it's not you trying, by the way. It's not you fighting to, to be better or be different. It's relying on God and his spirit. And I know that's a lot of churchy stuff I'm throwing out there, but I think it is important. And I think if those don't make sense to you, I think it's important to study and find a way to, to understand better. Okay, so we're in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 through 26. So I'll read that. Read along with me, please. I'm in the English Standard Version. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit. You will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. This is God's word. So walking in the Spirit has a way to help us. And what we're trying to figure out is what that means. And again, walking in the Spirit is this idea of being solely dependent on, on Christ and his Spirit. So what I want to break down over these next few verses is, is these are the topics we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how walking in the Spirit helps us, one, love each other, how it helps us be a more attractive church, how it helps us identify sin in our lives and how to avoid it, and ultimately how it produces fruit. So first in verses 13 through 15, it talks about how it helps us love each other and be a more attractive church. Uh, in verse 13, it says that, again, we've been set free from this legalism. We've been set free from adding something to the gospel that's not there. And then it also says that the Spirit is then, therefore, the power that we have in our Christian life. Uh, Romans 6, 14 through 15 says that sin will have no dominion over you because you are not under the law. Again, this, this idea that we have to follow these rules no longer holds to us because Christ took that on himself on the cross. Um, overall, the law, laws of the Old Testament are still good. There's still value in them. There's still moral standards. But the law does not give that power to obey. Um, and what he says is that all of the law can be summarized in the phrase, love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that's really interesting. How, how can this whole section in the back be encompassed by love your neighbor as yourself, right? The golden rule idea. Um, but if you think about it for a while, I think if you love others, do you steal from them? If you love others, do you lie to them? If you love others, are you jealous? 
Uh, love does transcend some of these things and give us an opportunity to avoid all those things in a natural way, in a really more genuine way, if you think about it. If you're trying to follow a list of rules, then you're just following a list of rules, and it's never going to feel genuine. Um, as opposed to, oh, I love you, so I naturally want to do this. So that's something to think about. That's kind of the, the core you'll see in a theme that was running through this is the idea of love. So again, Christ simplified it. By taking on all the law on himself, he simplified it and says, love God, love others, and all this other stuff will fall into place. You're still going to abide by the law, but it's because you're following me. Um, it's a natural byproduct. You know, think about loving a spouse or loving a child. Uh, when you love them, do you have to really think really hard about doing those things they want you to do? Do you really have to think very hard about uh, following that honey-do list, if you will, right? No, it's because you love that you naturally do it. So again, that's the idea. Uh, Jesus, again, fulfilled the law on our behalf. Uh, Romans 8, which is an awesome chapter, if you want just one chapter to read that has a lot in it. Romans 8, 1 through 14. Uh, Christ did what the law was powerless to do. The law could not save us. That's why they have to keep making sacrifices. The law could not save, but Christ satisfied that, fulfilled it. Um, a good illustration of this is uh, the idea of a power bar. So think about a power strip, whatever you call it, wherever you're from. Power bar, power strip, and I know that causes a little bit of flashback for people who live here in transformers and adapters and everything. But imagine a power strip that works and it's been plugged into the appropriate transformer at the right wattage. Okay, <laughs> and so, so you have a list, of, let's say, so you have five plugs on there and, and you, uh, the power strip is you, the power strip is you and, and, and the power needed to, to fund all the areas of your life. So you plug in your marriage, you plug in your, your, your kids, you plug in your church, your work, right? And all these things are pulling power from the power strip. And at the end, you see you have one other plug left. You're like, awesome, great. So you take the plug that's supposed to go into the wall and you plug it into that bottom. And you wonder why it doesn't work, right? Well, you're trying to pull power from its own source. It doesn't work, right? You need power from somewhere else. You need power from somewhere outside of that power strip. Uh, but so many times, we continually try to depend on our own strength. We depend on our own power to supply all these things. Well, it's a circular system. It's not going to work. I got very quickly out of electrical engineering and turned to psychology. Um, but enough I learned about circuits that that does not work. Um, and so I think it's really important that we see that we need a source greater than ourselves, something outside of us, if we're going to be able to supply power and energy to those areas of our life. Uh, the implication is this. So it's, again, it's twofold. So one direction is that uh, by walking the Spirit, we're able to love each other, and the other is that we're able to be an attractive church. For loving each other, um, he says in there that we should not be fighting one another, but we should loving instead. That sounds so simple, but we don't do it. We say that, and fighting sounds extreme, but even disagreements and gossip and like kind of pointing fingers at each other or, or judging each other, right? Those are all little things that come from not loving. Um, and it says in verse 14 that love conquers all things. And if I, so I'll repeat that kind of idea that if you love someone, are you going to lie to them? If you love someone, are you going to be jealous? If you love someone, are you going to steal from them? If you start with love, the other stuff kind of falls into place. Another reason that we love is because when you love these issues that maybe sometimes rip churches apart. Think about um, the way I like to describe it is open and close hand issues. So you have issues that are close hand issues. What I call those are the core beliefs of the church. So uh, I, I am not going to argue with you and yield to you if you say that Christ is not the only way to heaven. I'm going to hold on to that. This is, my this is the core of the gospel that I, I think is truth. But if you tell me I don't think drums should be on the worship team, well, I can say that an open hand issue, right? I don't think your salvation is going to depend on whether or not you believe one or the other on drums. I don't think it's going to change that. But I think, how many churches have you heard that have been split over those open hand issues, right? Uh, women can braid their hair or not. I mean, little tiny things that, that are, sure, you can, you can advocate one way or the other. I'm not saying that there's not a right or wrong answer. What I'm saying is it's not a gospel issue. So we end up ripping churches apart over those things. Um, and so I think what's important is that we recognize that through love, we avoid legalism because we're more open-minded to people's ideas. We, recognize, we talk, we communicate, and decide what the core issues are. So I think love conquers all things in that way. The other side of it is that we are an attractive church if we love um, and if we walk in the spirit. Um, there's a book called Everyday Church, uh, Tim Chester, t two guys, I apologize, I've quoted them, I'm not plagiarizing. So the Everyday Church talks about how uh, the current status of the church as we look across the U.S. And it's absolutely fascinating because what he says is if you look at the church from 1991 until now, twice as many adults are not going to church. So the amount of adults that has not gone to church has doubled since 1991 to now, okay? The 3,500 churches close every year in the U.S. 3,500 churches every year in the U.S. And of those remaining churches, 80% have either plateaued in membership or declined. Okay. So you, you think about that, and you have probably some thoughts in your head as to why that might be, and many would say, we need a reckoning. We need a revival. We do. Uh, many may, but the other question is, what are we doing? I mean, are we trying to apply the same thing to attract people to our churches? 
Are we using a 1950s mentality? I think about the 1950s when, like, the cool thing to do was go to church. You, you, you had the, the, the mom was at home, the dad was at work, the kids behaved, leave it to beaver style, you dress up in your suit, and you dress up in your suit and you go to church, and that's, that was part of the culture. What, what, are we still trying to apply the same thing now and wondering why it doesn't work? You're appealing to people who understood church, who grew up in church, but now, 80, something like 70% of people have never been to church. You know, some of this, this, this group of pocket of people has never seen church, so why are we trying to attract them the same way? What's a timeless way you attract people to a community of believers? You love. You love. Whether it's, in, in, if it was Jesus' time in the early church or whether it's 2,000 years from now, I guarantee you that if you're a community of people that loves and accepts each other, that's going to be attractive. You don't have to change how you do your worship or change your lights or change that, but if you're a community of believers that loves each other, that's what's going to be attractive. And so that's a timeless thing. And in John 13, 35, it says, this is how everyone will know you are my disciples because you followed all my list of rules. No, it doesn't say that. <laughs> it says, this is how everyone will know you are my disciples, that you what? Love one another. That's how we'll know. That's how they'll know you're Christian. Not because you look a certain way, you wear a certain outfit, or you act, it's because you love each other. That's what's going to attract people to you. That's what we're going to know you're Christ followers, that you're little Christians. You got to keep that in mind because we add so much to it, but it's pretty basic, but very hard. So now that we see how uh, walking the Spirit can allow us to, again, be, uh, help each other, love each other because we're not as judgy, and also we can help uh, attract us to church, it also helps us ID, ID and um, identify and resist kind of fleshly desires in our own lives. Um, I think the Holy Spirit is something interesting. When I say that, you're probably like, Holy Spirit. If I said Holy Ghost, it'd be even more weird, right? <laughs> but I, I, there's a Francis Chan. Remember her Francis Chan? So he wrote the book Crazy Love. He writes a book called The Forgotten God because he says pretty much we focus so much on the Father and the Son, we kind of forget about the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is one of the most important things to our faith because when Jesus ascended, he left the Holy Spirit to give us power. He go, to, it's what kind of drives us day to day. Um, and yet we don't talk about it very much, I think, because it's understood. But he explains why would God, in his infinite wisdom, say, I, wanna, I want my children to be characterized uh, by weakness, by a lack of boldness and timidity. Wouldn't he want us uh, be, to be known by our power, by our might? Uh, and so he gave the spirit for that purpose. So if we're not accepting and tapping into that, it's kind of on us, not on him. He gave it to us. Now, verse 16 uh, in, in, the, in the section of chapter 5 talks about uh, to walk. Uh, and the word here is peripatio. That's the Greek word, and the Greek word means to walk, and that's kind of boring. But to Hebrew, it means a lot more. When, when they put that word down to the Hebrews, it meant something different. It meant how you conduct oneself and how you pass one's life. Well, that's a little more robust. That's pretty interesting. That the idea is that when you walk in the Spirit, it's how you, you actually conduct your life. You live daily in the Spirit. Uh, Romans 8, 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit sounds pretty basic, but again, if we're rooted in and we're tapped into that power source of the Holy Spirit, it's a natural byproduct. It's input-output. One really cool thing about verse 18 is it talks about, um, it's not saying that the Spirit did work, and it's not saying that the Spirit will work. It's saying it's active. It's present right now. It's ongoing. And what's interesting about that is it's pretty cool to think about that the Spirit is active in each one of our lives. If you accepted Christ as your Savior, then the Spirit is working in you. It is there. How much you tap into it and how much you allow it to work is up to you, but it is there and it's continually working, and that should encourage us. Uh, one thing when I think about how when you focus on the spirit, you do spirit things, when you focus on the flesh, you do flesh things, uh, is an analogy that actually Pastor gave last week, which I really liked. He used the hymn, uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, uh, and if you've heard that one, it says, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Um, cool song. But what does it mean? If you're looking at Jesus, the other things kind of fade away, right? If you're focused on him, the other stuff falls apart. If you're tapped in the spirit, those fall apart. I have an exercise for everyone to, one, make sure you're awake, and two, uh, to bring this point home. So pick something on the wall, pick something up here, look at something and focus on it. Use your center of your vision to focus on it. It's clear? Is it clear-ish? <laughs> center of vision. Okay, and I want you to bring your hand up on the, from the outside in, right? Bring it up here. So keep focused on that thing. Keep focusing on that thing. Is the hand clear? No. Is it blurry? Why? Because you're focused on something else. That's how eyes work. You have rods, you have cones, you can break it down for you, but the point is that you, you can, it's blurry because you're focused on something else. But if you pass that hand in front of you, your eyes usually, mine are all jacked up, but if you're usually, <laughs> you'll, you'll, <laughs> you'll, focus on that, you'll, you'll focus on the hand. You'll adjust to that moving thing that's coming into your life, right? 
And the point behind all that is if you're focused on him, it's very hard to focus on something else. You, your eyes cannot focus on two things. You focus on one thing, and then if it's on the side. So 8,000 things can be around here in your peripheral, but if you're focused on one thing, that is what matters to you, and everything else kind of fades. Another example for those, if, if you don't get into the vision thing, would be painkillers. My favorite class in undergrad was biopsychology. And in biopsychology, we learned about what medication does to your body. And my, you know, when you take an Advil, we know you feel better, but why do you feel better? Why do you feel better when you take an Advil? And what's happening in your body is, uh, you know, when you, when you have pain, your nerves are going, ow, 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 and they're sending the signal in the synapses saying, hey, I'm hurt, I'm hurt. When you take a painkiller, it slows the amount of information that's flowing between the synapses. It dulls it. It takes it away. It makes it less relevant. So another idea to think about if that helps you understand how when you're tapped into the spirit, these other things fade and dull in comparison. Uh, J.D. Greer talks about how he counsels a lot of different people for addictions. Um, and he finds that there's a lot of stuff out there in psychology and counseling on how to behavior modify to stop an addiction. And many of those work for certain periods of time. He goes, but you know what the most successful thing I've ever had is when I give them something else to focus on, when something else absorbs their time, their energy, and their love. Uh, and so for him, it's, it's Christ. If I can focus you on, on, on the gospel, on, on Christ, then the other stuff is less interesting. The addictions are less, have less of a grip because they fade in light of what you're focusing on. Does that make sense? Okay. The implication is this, that walking in the Spirit gives us the power to avoid those things. But again, it's not I'm, I'm playing whack-a-mole with these different flesh diseases I have. Um, it, it will never work. I'm tapped into a source, and that is naturally making everything fade away. Uh, religion says this. It says, try harder. It says, do this better. But our faith says to rely more on the Spirit. It's about heart transformation as opposed to behavior modification. Have you heard that before? So it's about in-out, not out-in. I change my heart, and then an outflow comes. Okay. So we've seen all these things that can help us with, but what uh, are the results of either, one, tapping into the Spirit or not? And that's where we get into verses 19 through 26. Uh, Paul compares and contrasts the flesh and the Spirit. So he's pretty much saying, hey, when you follow the flesh, this is what comes out of it, and this is what the Spirit provides in the fruit of the Spirit, as we all probably know. Pretty stark contrast in the two, the two lines. So the works of the flesh, sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. If you're like me, I hone in on like two things that I've never even thought in my life about doing, and I go, I'm good. It's easy to look at the list and see the extremes and say, I'm not in that list. I'll draw your attention to a couple, and I want you to think about your life. Uh, fits of anger, dissensions, rivalry, jealousy, envy, divisions. That's a little bit more of a list we could probably say, eh, I've done that a couple times, right? So we've all seen these things in our life, uh, the, these things that um, are, are part of our old nature, our sin nature. Uh, what's interesting, uh, uh, J.D. Greer, when he's talking about this, I'm sorry, Kyle Edelman, when he's talking about it, he says, if you, if you package that as a whole and try to say, what does this mean? It's when there's actually a lack of love. It's the same thing as I described before about how when you're loving someone, it's easy to do these, these good things, um, and you won't do these bad things. But these are all things that would harm others. These, if th doing these things are not just, they're, they're a selfish thing that actually harms others as compared to the fruit of the spirit, which talks about things that actually build others up. It's rooted in love. Uh, so again, so if you look at the fruit of the spirit, it says love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. For those who have kids, there's like a song and it's <laughs> been in my head for about two months and it is just, but, but they're there, right? These are these fruits of the spirit. And wow, wouldn't that be an awesome resume? Wouldn't you like to slap that down here? Here's a few of my qualities. Just want you to know. This is my, these are my character traits. If I had to pick a list, it'd be these. You know, th how great would that be if that defined us? And what they're saying is that is available to us uh, as a fruit of the Spirit. Um, you could do a sermon on each one of these, but I do want to just break down a few of them uh, briefly so you can think about if that fruit is evident in your life. Love comes from the word agape. You've probably heard the word agape before, but it's this idea there's multiple forms of love. Agape is brotherly love. Uh, it's uh, love and affection. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 13, uh, 4 through 7. You probably haven't heard it since your last wedding, but I'd like to read it to you uh, because I think it's really um, a, good, a good overview of what love is, but also how it relates to everything we just talked about because uh, love is first for a reason here. Uh, it, it is the core uh, of, of what, and I would say it contrasts the flesh, it helps you fight the flesh, and it amplifies these fruits of the Spirit. So uh, again, this is 1 Corinthians 13, I'm reading 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. 
It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Think about how that contrasts to the flesh. And it even calls out a few of them. It says, love defeats those things of the flesh. In the other way, it says, it boosts up these things of the spirit. Um, in our church vision meetings we've been having for, for the past few, uh, well, about a month, but a couple different meetings, love has been a theme that we've seen kind of throughout our topic of what do we want to be as a church? What do we want to look like? And how do we want to reach people? And, and love is the core. I know it's a fluffy word, but we have to figure out what it means because it's so important. Uh, joy, joy is a great word. Um, it comes uh, from, the, from James 1 is a really good section that talks about, about joy, about how kind of all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. That doesn't sound like the joy I think of, which is happiness. It's actually something that transcends trials and issues. It's something that in the midst of trial, we have to actually have joy. Um, and so that's the one there. Peace, uh, tranquility, and the idea of harmony. See how that relates to how we look as a church and how we appeal to others. Patience. Uh, patience, of course, being able to wait, but I think it's deeper than that. Some definitions I saw talk about steadfastness and endurance, being able to be resilient. Resilience is a term we use a lot in our military now, being able to withstand things that come your way. Uh, faithfulness is a great one that's pretty action-packed. Uh, conviction or belief, it's kind of how we relate to God, uh, where our trust is, where we, where we lean on. Gentleness is great. Actually, this word is only used three other times in the Bible. It's pretty unique, and it comes from the word meekness. I'm sure you've heard of the word meekness before. And if you're like me, I kind of always thought it was related to weakness, not just because it rhymed, but because it was something that seemed like a, a, a timid kind of type B introverted, like hide and don't be scared. Um, and so I, I attribute it to that. But the real definition of it is reserve strength. I've heard that before. Reserve strength. You have the power and ability to do something, uh, yet you're able to hold it back in how you interact with others. Self-control is the last one, and this is one who's mastered their desires. Um, so that's an interesting list, and it's, it's good to think about. Wh where are you on that list? Do you have those fruits evident in your life? Uh, verse 24 talks about how if you belong to Christ, then he has crucified the flesh and his passions and desire, meaning that that flesh list that we talked about is, is already dead, and if you see it popping up, it's something you've got to adjust. You need his strength to fix that. He's already defeated it. Uh, verse 25 is a, is a great section and good for us military folks. It's, uh, it talks about keeping a step with the Spirit. Um, I want to read it real quick. Uh, verse 25 says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Uh, the definition here is walking in line behind a leader. That's, that's what that, that word means. And I think us military folks can get behind that, right? So you have someone marching ahead of you, you're marching in step with them. Um, for those who went to basic or some form of basic, when you were marching, were you really thinking about where you were going? Were, were you responsible for giving directions? Maybe if you had a role as the, the element leader, sure. But for, if you're number three back in the line, you're literally just following that person. That, that is your role, right? You, you follow that person. Um, almost blindly to the point where you're, you're, you're completely trusting that person is telling you the right way to go. Um, this is the same idea that when we walk in the spirit, we're blindly following the spirit to the point where we're saying, I, I trust you to lead me. And I'm not going to worry about going left or right or where I'm going. I'm going to follow you. And so that's the example there. Um, it also has this idea of consistency and daily. Uh, you can't do a static. You can't just check in every week if you want to live by the Spirit. Um, the Spirit has to be something that is part of your lifeblood. It's what you do. It's day in and day out. Uh, and that term is actually only used five times in the Bible. I just find this stuff kind of interesting. And it's referred to a disciplined walking in order. Right? Following that. Uh, I think the best illustration is not one that I came up with or any really, really smart pastor, but it's one Jesus came up with, and that's in John. And it talks about the true vine in chapter 15, verse 1 through 7. And what he describes there is he says, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. Think about, well, great, it's in Italy, right? You see all these vineyards all around, and you see the, see the kind of the gnarled vine coming out of the ground, right? And then everything comes from it, but it's just one vine that's coming down. And that is rooted in, in Christ. And he says, I'm this true vine. If you want to see that fruit we're talking about, and you're the branch, it comes from where your root is. If your root is in him, the fruit's going to come from whatever root it is. If it's rooted as an apple tree, it's going to be apples. If it's a grape, it's going to be grapes, right? It has to be rooted in whatever that thing is. And he pretty much says that if you abide in me and I in you, then you're going to produce this fruit. Um, so if we're not tapped into him, if we're not rooted in him, then we shouldn't expect anything different to come out. Um, I've always struggled with this, and I, I don't know if you're like me, but how much do I do and how much do I trust God to do? Where, where's the balance? You know, what... what, what you know, step out in faith. Okay, I'm stepping, but he's the faith. I don't, I don't know which, which part's my role, part's his. And I think it's very challenging. 
I think we should always probably err on the side of trust him, <laughs> but there are some things we can do tangibly, I think, to act. What, what we talked about here is, is pruning off those things that, that are bad in our lives. We need his strength to do it, but we have to act. If we see these fleshly things coming up, we have a role in trying to defeat that and trying to put ourselves in a situation where we avoid that under his strength. Um, I'll repeat something as I, as I work towards a close here. I'll repeat something that um, I said earlier, and I think this is really critical. Uh, religion will always tell you to try harder, will always tell you to, um, that there's more things to do, there's more steps, there's more behaviors to change. Uh, but Paul is talking about something very, very different here. He's talking about relying on God. He's talking about putting your hope and faith in him to guide you. Um, that should relieve us in some ways that we don't have to, that we don't have to do. Because if you're like me, you've tried and you fail over and over again. Uh, we need his strength in order to be able to, to make change. Uh, we want that heart transformation over behavior modification. And again, if we tap into him, over time we should see these fruits kind of rise up in our lives. Um, and what it's going to make us is we're going to be a, a, a we're going to be marked. We're going to be characterized by a church that one we love each other, we care about each other. Uh, we're attractive to the outside because we're loving each other. We're easily identifying issues, and we're able to address them. And ultimately, we're producing this fruit that will glorify God in the end. Uh, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, thank you for this time that we could uh, delve into your word. I pray that my ramblings would not be a uh, distraction, but yet it would be something that you will use to glorify you. I ask that you would help us to see how we need you, how we need your spirit in our lives uh, to guide us. Help us to understand these hearts concepts. Help us to take, uh, take note of the fact that you are the only one who can solve our issues and our problems. Uh, help us to continue to grow in these areas. Help us to build one another up and edify each other. Help us to love well. Help us to love each other in a way that is noticeable, that those around us, that those outside of us say, what is different? How can I get some of that love? Thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray in your son's name.